All right, brother, thank you so much. Take our Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Mark, the book of Mark, and chapter 5. And the last few verses of chapter 4, we're going to look at some of those as well. Uh, It's a wonderful thing to know the Lord Jesus and to be saved and to have the blessed assurance that he has done it all for us. Nothing we could add, nothing we could take away. Uh, They sing about the grace that reaches as far as our sin was low, and certainly it has done that. I praise God for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, I think I spoke on the blood the last time that I had the opportunity here, and I'm thankful again for Pastor giving me this opportunity. You found your place in Mark Chapter 5, we're going to read a few verses. I'm not going to read the whole thing because i got too many illustrations. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've had to wean and whittle and carry on all afternoon trying to get down to something acceptable. But I had a lot of illustrations on these subjects tonight, and uh, they'll have to wait for some other time to use some of the more interesting ones that take time to tell. Mark chapter 5, and they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarians. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Go over to verse 35. While Jesus yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, which said, Thy daughter's dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid. Only believe. Let's pause and ask God's help. Father, thank you now for the blessings of the hymns, special music. Lord, the fact of being here with God's people. Thank you that as we can come freely in this land still, we can hold up the truth, which is the Savior. We can expound the scriptures, exalt the Savior, and even expose sin. So I pray tonight that there would be a blessing for everyone here. Those that listen on the net, there may be something for them. Encouragement. Some instruction. Perhaps a rebuke. But Lord, you have your will and way in my heart. Fill me with the Spirit of God now. And let the Word of God prevail. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in chapter 4, uh, we see that um, Jesus has been teaching in parables. And uh, it says, as a matter of fact, in verse 34, it says, But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. From this verse to the next verse, there is a line of demarcation. Something is going to change here. He's been instructing them. He's been giving them precept upon precept, principle upon principle, with parables, just talking to them, ministering to them, illuminating them, teaching them of the things of God. But now, it's time for something else. You'll find in your life, there'll come a time when there's a time for something else. If I were to title the message, it would simply be, Why Troublest Thou the Master? And putting the emphasis upon the fact that he is, in truth, the Master. Uh, In verse 35 of chapter 4, it says, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And what takes place here, and as I said, we're not going to read it all, because most of this is very familiar, I'm sure, to most. But what takes place here 
is there is a boarding of a vessel. Uh, they're going to go from one side of the sea over to the other side. And uh, we see it says in verse 36, and there were also with him other little ships. So this is a bit of a flotilla, not a massive military operation or anything like that. But there are those, especially the disciples, who are close to him, who have been sitting under his teaching, who have been absorbing what they need to have to go out and to minister the word of God. It's kind of like when uh, someone goes off to Bible school, and I know that there are practicums in Bible school as well, but you go there to be familiarized with every book of the Bible, as many Christian doctrines as they can uh, get into you, and then they require you to do something of service, they call it, or practicum. For me, for pastor, for others, when we went to Tennessee Temple, it was either go down to the city mission and preach. Uh, for me, it was to go out and, and tr uh, preach uh, weekend revivals. I had a song, uh, or I had a pianist that traveled with me some. But you had to come back on Monday and fill out a service report as to what you did in a practical way. This is the line that I'm talking about. Jesus has been speaking to them. Now he's going to take them on the great venture of the Christian walk in faith. In faith. Now, as they board the ship or they board the little vessels, whatever uh, they had there, in my mind's eye, I think about those little fishing vessels that uh, Jesus called the disciples from, some of them. And uh, they could probably hold all the disciples and the Lord Jesus. You know the story, a great tempest arises on the sea, and uh, Jesus is asleep on a pillow in the hinder part of the vessel. Um, should we wake him? Should we disturb him? He's been busy. He's been teaching. Uh, the teaching of the Word of God uh, takes labor. And so the disciples, I'm sure, asked themselves, what should we do? Things get a little worse. The waves beat upon the boat, beat upon the vessel, begins to fill up. Oh, I think maybe we should wake him because we're rowing and struggling and bailing out the boat and uh, trying to uh, stay afloat here. And so are these other little ships around us that are watching what we're doing, what's happening in our vessel, because they know that Jesus is in our vessel. So what should we do? Well, they come, uh, finally, and they awaken him, the Lord Jesus. And uh, verse 38, it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now, throughout these scriptures we're going to look at tonight, there is an overriding theme of fear versus faith. There's going to be a lot of fear, a lot of fright. There's going to be all kinds of things in a chaotic way that are happening. They're now away from the teaching aspect, and they're now into the practicum or the practical aspect of ministry. And I want you to know the first thing that Jesus took them to was a very frightening experience. He says, let us pass over to the other side. This is going to be a frightful night for these men. Now, even though they, some of them were experienced uh, mariners, uh, the disciples are fearful because they're about to sink. I know people that are deathly afraid of the water. Uh, that's why they struggle so much even with baptism sometimes. Uh, just deathly afraid of going down into the water and letting another person have control of them and put them down under the water and bring them back up. And sometimes it takes a while because they do have this awful fear 
of going under the water that they're not going to come up or they're not going to be able to breathe, whatever. There's all kinds of phobias, and I thought about making a list of phobias tonight, but there's no need. Most of us have uh, some fears in our life, so you know what I'm talking about. There are fears. When Jesus takes them on this cross sea journey. By his direction, they get in the boat. And so do these others get in these little boats around them. So this flotilla begins to go out over the sea, and the storm rages. He's asleep. They wake him. And the first thing he does is he gets up. He arose, in verse 39, and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. A great calm. It's an amazing thing how that the Lord Jesus, by simple word of his mouth, because he is in control of all things, because he has the power over everything that we as human beings know anything about, whether it be an earthquake, which kills 45,000 people in uh, the Far East, or, the, or not the Far East, but the East the other day, in Syria and Turkey, or whether it be a tsunami that takes away people by flood, our Lord God has control over all of these elements. There's not one thing that he cannot stop or start, by the way. I believe he started this tempest. While he was asleep, God started this tempest and brought it down upon these disciples to teach them a very quick and practical lesson. What is that lesson? Well, this lesson has to do with uh, fear when you cannot look after your own needs. I'm sure they were rowing and struggling and bailing and doing everything they could, but it wasn't working. It wasn't happening. And so Jesus awakes, comes and simply says, peace be still. And the waves laid down like little lambs and licked his hand from being a torrent to being calm in a moment. And you know as well as I do that sometimes as a believer, you've come to a tempestuous time in your life, a time when it seems like everything's coming apart, and the only resort you have is to fall upon your knees and say, oh God, I need your help. Be that refuge you promised. And all of a sudden, the peace just overwhelms you. It's going to be all right. He's going to take care of it. He's the one who has the word and the power to take care of it. They're fearful. In verse 40, he asked them the question, why are ye so fearful? I think he had a legitimate reason to ask them that. He'd been teaching them about himself. He'd been teaching them about who he is, what he was about, He'd been giving parables and explaining those parables to them. They had knowledge of who he was. They had been given what was necessary to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, I mean, things are big time trouble. Big time trouble. And they've got to trouble the master. They've got to go and say, you, you don't care that we're going to perish here. What an accusation. He's taught them that he's love. He's taught them that he loves all. He's taught them he loves specifically them as his own chosen disciples. What an accusation. And I realize that there are times when we get into situations which, man, we kind of forget what the Lord's done for us in some ways. It took a miracle to save my soul, folks. And it took a miracle to save your soul. I'm talking about the greatest miracle that you and I may ever know is the salvation which God brought into your life so that you could call upon the Lord Jesus and be born from above and to be saved. You may never realize it until life has taken a long journey. You've gone on a journey with it, but the greatest miracle is I've been saved. I'm on my way to glory. And there's nothing that keep, can keep me from going. 
because he's guaranteed it. Verse 41. He said, why have you no faith? But in verse 41 it says, and they feared exceedingly. They, they couldn't get over their fear here, even though he had just said, peace be still. They feared again when they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So the first thing from teaching and instruction and receiving the teaching and instruction from none other than the word himself, he said, okay, we're going to go across the sea here. We're, sta we're starting our venture of Christian walk and venture of walking with the Lord and our venture of seeing what Christian walk is all about. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I do not believe that it's much different today. Many people report in testimony through the written uh, books and biographies and other things that people share with you that they got saved and then all of a sudden they started learning, they started maybe memorizing some scriptures, they started getting hold of the truth of the eternal God and man, they were thrown in the midst of a tumultuous sea and their boat was filling up. Why trouble ye the master? Well, he's the master. He's the answer. He's the one who can deliver. So it says there's no need to fear. He controls every and all tempests. That's who the Lord is. I'm so glad I know him. I, I, I could give you some illustrations about the dangerous things that uh, took place in my ministry over the years, the, even on the waters. Motors that cut out were seven miles out to sea, and we thought we went out there to have a little fish on the barrier reef. Sharks all around us, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to die. Well, you know, I was a little older in the faith, and I'd seen the Lord do some things, and so I said, I'm not dying out here. I'm not going to be shark food, and what are we going to do? We're going to pray. And so we prayed, and guess what? Another little boat come by that had power and towed us to a safe place. God answers our prayer and our need, but he's teaching us that he's always there to hear our prayer. He's always there to hear the cry of his people. So oftentimes I've been guilty, I'm sure every person here has been guilty, that we go to everybody else to help us before we ever get down on our knees and confess to the Lord. There's no other place to go to, no other person. And then when we do, we kind of kick ourselves a little bit, and we should, that we haven't gone to him first and foremost. I think we'd help ourselves down the road of life a lot if we would do that, don't you? Secondly, the next thing that takes place here in this walk of the Christian with the Lord Jesus is something that a lot of people are afraid of. The demons. In chapter 5, they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarians, and when he was come out of the ship, look at it, immediately. It wasn't any time, but it was immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now, again, looking at this and pondering it, I put myself in my mind's eye there. We've just come through a major deliverance. We may be soaking wet, we may be toweling off, but we just landed on shore. Man, I'm glad to get my feet back on shore here. And the Lord steps out of the ship, and here comes a wild man running down at him. I mean, this man, he is so wild, so strong. His community has tried to bind him. 
They've tried to put him in chains. They've tried to put him in fetters. And as you read those scriptures, you find out that there's not a fetter, there's not a chain in the whole community that he could not break. And he was breaking them so that he could do them damage. Demons don't do anything to help us. Demons are unleashed in this world to do everything they can to destroy true Christianity and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and mine. A lot of people kind of avoid the subject. But the second practicum, the very second one, the first one was being almost shipwrecked, almost drowning, almost going down in a watery grave, experienced mariners, fishermen, so scared they were trembling at the Lord's command. Now, they're standing next to the Lord Jesus on this shore, and this guy comes screaming and swearing and carrying on down at the Lord Jesus. You know, I, uh, again, have a lot of illustrations having traveled in some third world countries and preaching in third world countries where down in Haiti, the voodoo and the demonic worship, the different things went on down in Haiti while we were down there preaching. In New Guinea, up in the highlands, in the Sepik Valley where there were still cannibals up there. In Vanuatu, the old French New Hebrides Islands. Still in places, the stench of rotting human flesh from wars and people going against each other, killing each other. I was with missionary John Owens from South Carolina in New Guinea in the Highlands. We were riding up the road into the mountainous area where we were going to have some meetings. And uh, the road was treacherous enough. Drop off a couple of thousand feet on one side and uh, rough walls on the other side. And here come about 200 uh, natives, all painted up with war paint and uh, all their spears and everything else. And it's a hectic, chaotic seen. I looked over and John was just kind of relaxed and calm. I said, I'm going to die here today. John just said, relax. Well, I looked around. Here's 200 coming up behind us. They're all going hooga booga, hooga booga, hooga booga. And, you know, they're, they're ready to do some damage. And the next thing I know, there's a face looking right here at me. It's got a bone struck through his nose like that, and another one through his lip like that. And he is just about the, well, I want to say it, but I won't. I mean, he's a human being. But he had so disfigured himself with piercings and cuttings and bones and, and stuff that you just don't imagine what, what it's like until you get there and you're seeing it for your very self. And this guy is screaming at John. And John knows the language, so John says, listen, and I'm interpreting. He said, this is a man of God here, mate, pointing at me. I said, don't blame it on me, John. <laughs> you know, I mean, if there's any way that we can escape it, just don't blame it on me, please. I still have a wife and a daughter. I want to go home and see. John says, just relax, Glenn. He said, they want you to get out of the truck. I, I, I must admit, I, I, you know, I always thought I was quite courageous. You know, I had the, all of the ranger stuff and all this kind of business in the military. I was scared to death. You know, it wouldn't bother me to maybe get shot, but I don't have strips of skin pulled off me. <laughs> so anyway, John says, get out of the truck. I said, John, are you kidding me or what? And he said, no, get out of the truck. They want to show you something. He said, they want to show me something. I, I'm struggling here just to s s remain conscious and not faint. 
I got out of the truck. And this fella, who, you know, he's got scars and, and things all over his body, which are just unbelievable from battle wounds and all this. He takes me by the hand. They do this a lot in New Guinea. They grab you by the hand, lead you around like a little. It's because I, I, I had no ability to move anyway. And he takes me over off the side of the road. John's still sitting in the truck. And I'm looking back, and John says, just go along, go along. I, I thought John wanted to do away with me because I was too much of a burden. Take me through the bush about 15 feet. It's a large, flat rock. And it's got blood all over it. I knew I was going to die. And John gets out of the truck finally, he comes over, and he said he's pointing at the blood there because it's where they killed the chief from this other 200 that's behind us yesterday. And this is where they cut him open and ate his heart. I said, then what? He said, yeah, they, that's what they do. They get this war going up there and all the crazies and the demons come out everywhere and uh, they start fighting and cutting and, sl and doing slashing people to ribbons. And, and he said, the thing they're after is to get the, the chief or the elder of the tribe and kill him and get his heart out of his chest so they can eat it and get whatever power he had. I said, John, I'd like to go home now. I couldn't take it now. I'm too old. I, I, I would faint. I'd have a heart attack. We made it out of there, obviously. But they were fearful of this shocking man. I was fearful of this fella. Man, he had daggers and arrows and knives. and uh, They were fearful of this shocking man that come running at him out of the tombs. I, I think this fella was probably so marked up and, and, and scarred up. and I mean, it, look what it says of him. It says he, night and day he's in the mountains and in the tombs. And what was he doing? He was cutting himself to let the blood run. He's marking up his body. Oh, we have fun in the Western world. We say, oh, God doesn't care if I cut myself here or cut myself here or, or put a puncture in my body somewhere and maybe stick a thing up through my tongue or, or whatever. We, we think we're sophisticated. Listen, you ain't got nothing on those people. They got holes where they're not supposed to have. All kinds of them. Fearful, this shocking man. But you know, all were afraid except one. Lord Jesus. He knew what this was all about. He was calm. And I put down here what we need as Christians. Because a few years ago, there was this big deal about going out and trying to cast out demons. <laughs> the disciples didn't say anything about demons here. The disciples held their peace, did nothing. What? Let Jesus handle it. And that's what I say. If I'm walking with the Lord and I'm confronted by a demon, whether it be a, a low-down, rotten drug dealer down here on the corner who's uh, given fentanyl to our kids, that, believe me, they're filled with demons, these people. You look at some of the people that are coming across that southern border, they've got more demons resident in them than this fellow had, and he had enough to fill up 2,000 swine. But we in the sophisticated West, we say, well, you know, we don't have a demonic problem. They're filled with demons. The demons are helping them, advancing them, protecting them. That's why we have so many gotaways down there on that, central bo on that southern border. These people who are mules and carrying the drugs and the fentanyl and everything else across the border, human trafficking, bringing uh, little children to be debauched by society. They're filled.
filled with demons. You don't have to look very far. There's demons right here in Huntsville. There's demons right here in Madison. I'm going to tell you something in a minute. You're going to be surprised. Just watch Jesus take care of the demons. We don't have to. Praise God. Even Michael the archangel dares not bring a railing accusation against the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And yet we got unlearned Christian desperados or whatever. They're out there. They're going to cast out some demons. And one of the questions I always ask them, where are you sending them? Don't send them my way. Thirdly, everybody that had gone over on that little flotilla and the disciples were observing. They were not participating in this exorcism of these demons, but they were observing it. And of course, you know what happened. There's jokes about hogicide and all this kind of stuff. We're not going to stay there very much longer, but simply say this. The Christian walk and the Christian venture of faith. Two things right up front. Jesus took them to a challenge about their own life on the water. And then the very next thing, he confronted them with demonic activity. You may not recognize it because we think that it's only down in Haiti, it's only down in, uh, you know, uh, these places that are dark and dreary. When I was down in South Africa, we stopped by the roadside and there was a lineup of these booths selling everything from uh, uh, idols to whatever. And this fellow wants to give me a tattoo. And he was doing some kind of hooga booga in the back of the, of the little uh, booth that he was working. I said, you take your tattoo and go peddle it somewhere else. Well, we just, you know, put a nice little map of South Africa on your arm or on your back even. You know, that's that's the big thing these days. Use your back for a mural for the ink of the devil. All these people are observing what the Lord did here. And so were the swine herders. These fellows were out there looking after their Money and the swine, swine go running down the hill, kill themselves. And it says of these fellows, they were afraid and they fled. Verse 14, it says, and they fled, which fed, uh, and they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what was done. These people are scared, slapped to death. Their, their economy has just gone south completely. Then we have another incident which takes place on the heels of this. And we see that Jesus tells this fellow, I, I, I skip over this a little bit, but he tells this fellow, no, you can't come with me. I want you to go back in the city and tell your friends and co-workers and all that you know what great things the Lord has done for you. What did he do for him? He cast out the demons and then this fellow who had his inner man, the inner man was addressed. The needs of the inner man, not the outer man. Jesus didn't come and says, you got to do this and you got to do that. You got to do another thing and you got to look pretty and you got to look uh, just so trim and all this kind of stuff. You need to lose weight or whatever. No, Jesus didn't say any of that stuff. He addressed the inner man, that person that's inside. If you are soul winning, if you are talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation, you address the need of the inner man. Why? Because if you get the inner man right, the outer man will right itself. This is what's killed a lot of the evangelism which has gone on in independent Baptist churches especially. Get the inner man right. Get him saved, get him taught, get him baptized. He'll look around. You know, people aren't dumb. Well, some maybe, but 
Most are a little bit smart. They look around and they can see when they come in here, there's something different. As a matter of fact, there's a lot different being in here tonight than in the local concert hall or the local tavern. There's 180 degrees different. Now, we see on the heels of this, number three, a desperate elder. A desperate elder. We see demons. We see the disciples sinking, the demons threatening. Now, thirdly, we see a desperate elder, verse 35. This man, who is an elder in the synagogue, his name is Jairus, and uh, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, verse 22. But this man, Jairus, interesting character because he's one of the higher-ups in the religions of that area, in the religion of the Jews. He's an elder in the synagogue. And you know what? Even with that high position in the synagogue, it's all for naught for him. It's all failed. It's all come to ruination because his 12-year-old daughter is lying at the point of death. And his religion will do nothing for him. Isn't that like so much religion today? You, and this is what I wanted to let you know in advance. There's demons in the religion of the world. Just read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe, or 11. He says, even Satan transforms his ministers into angels of light, false teachers. And in the religious systems of the world who are not true to the inerrant word of God, they compromise it. And there's churches all around Madison who don't believe that the scriptures are authoritative. They don't believe that they're inspired. They don't believe any of this. And they've got a demon in there somewhere who is leading them away from the truth. Mark it down. You say, Brother Weeks, it's pretty staggering when, oh no, you look at Betty White, you look at the Russellites, uh, you look at any of the cults, any one of them, and you look long enough and turn the onion peels back, you'll find there was a demon in there in one of their leaders, and he had supernatural, pervasive and persuadable power to get people by the thousands to follow him. Do you know that the Mormon cult have in their cult taken 30% from Baptist circles? Yeah. Now, there's a couple of reasons probably, but again, not tonight. It's another time. But here's a desperate elder. This, this fella who's had the place of prominence, he's had the place of leading, he's had the place of uh, administering uh, different things within the synagogue. It's all failed and fallen. It's crumbled in his life because he loves his little baby girl and she's laying at the point of death and he runs into the midst of the, of the turmoil and the multitude that was following. He bars his way in there and he falls down at Jesus' feet, which is quite a humbling thing for somebody of that position. The Jews didn't want to admit that Jesus was God and that he was their Messiah. They wanted nothing to do with him. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and and, and scribes, everything they could talk about was, how are we going to destroy this guy? And here comes this elder, and he falls down before the Lord. It says in verse 23, 
He besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. He became a believer to follow the Lord and ask. Somewhere along the line, he said, my religion hasn't helped. Religion has failed. Everyone who's ever depended upon it failed. And what is the result? It's always fear. 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 But thankfully, we see the compassion of the Lord Jesus here. Mindful, we're mindful now that the disciples are right there close at hand. And he's leading them. It's chaotic. It's messy. There's lots of things happening. This is not just a very uh, nice little uh, parade down the road here. People are trying to get close to Jesus and some may be even getting trampled. But this guy gets in there and says, I need you, Lord. My daughter needs you. In the walk of faith, we may come across emergencies like this. I'm sure we will. I have. A friend of mine lives in central Florida, called me up one day. I happened to be home. I was home from a trip. Raymond said on the phone, he said, Glenn, I need you to pray. I said, what's the matter, Raymond? He said, Jessica, my little girl just fell out of a tree stand and broke her back right in half. I said, right now we'll pray. I said, let's pray and then we'll talk some more. So we prayed, asked the Lord to do his will. I said, Raymond, do you want me to come? He said, no, you've done everything I've asked you to and more. Praise the Lord. She come through it. She's a young woman walking around on both feet from a broken back. We see this elder's desperate. He wants his daughter to be healed, and Jesus did not heal her immediately. He said, you come along with me. Jesus went with him. Much people followed and thronged him in verse 24. Now, you know the story that's coming next. There's a woman who has an issue of blood. She's had it for 12 years. She spent everything she has, every might, on physicians. No one has been able to give her a bomb that would work. No one has been able to work a miracle in her life. She's completely bankrupt and she's dying. She's a destitute woman. She's not some high flyer. No, she's somebody that's groveling down on planet Earth just trying to figure out how she can be made well and how she can have some comfort. She's heard of Jesus. And she says to herself, if I can come in the press behind, verse 27, and touch his garment. Just touch it. But that's not what the Greek word says there. The Greek word says she wants to cleave onto it and hold onto it like Jacob did with the angel until he got a blessing. I mean, she's determined. She just doesn't want a little brush with Jesus. She wants to grab it and hang on. And Jesus said, who touched me? His disciples said, listen, we're in the middle of this massive throng of people. And you're wondering who touched you. He simply turned around and looked at her because he knew. And you know what it says? But the woman, verse 33, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Isn't it wonderful how honest we get when we have a conversation with Jesus or a confrontation? We get real honest. She told him everything. So destitute woman, 
her last hope. She's afraid of her future. And Jesus says to her, thy faith in him hath made thee whole. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Fear everywhere in this world, isn't there? I mean, there are people who are fearful just to go outside. We, we saw a lot of fear, and some legitimate, I'm sure, in the last three or four years with COVID. But you know, before COVID, the influenza, the smallpox, the other pestilences and sicknesses of this old sin-cursed world were bad as well. The bubonic plague, the black plague. People were fearful. But they still had to go out and make a living. They still had to go out and hoe the garden. They still had to go into the marketplace and try to buy something or sell something. They still had to go out. And they had to deal with their fear. The world's full of fear. People try to dis dispel the fear and dissuade the fear by doing certain things. For some, it's grab a bottle and go over in the corner and wipe yourself out in a drunk. For others, it's, well, maybe I can take some oxycodone. Or maybe I can get some painkillers which will make me blotto for a while. For others, it's, I'm going to apply myself to work so that I can work 24-7 if possible, just to get my mind off of my fear. The fear that's displayed throughout these incidences is mind-boggling in some ways. People are fearful. You find them at work, I'm sure you do. People are afraid of the boss. They're afraid of the economy. They're afraid of malady. They're afraid of desertion, betrayal. They're afraid of all kinds of things. And you know what? We can say, hey, stop. Got something, got something to help you with your fear. The greatest thing is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You get him to come and live in you by his spirit, and you can have calm which passes all understanding. I mean, you, you're sure, you're going to have difficult days, and you're going to have problems along the way, but why not trouble the master? That's why he came. You know those people that came to Jairus and said, why trouble you the master? Your daughter's dead. Don't make a fool of yourself. Don't go down that aisle. Don't confess that you've got fear about dying and not going to heaven. Don't. Come to Christ. He'll take all of that fear away. You don't have to lay your head upon the pillow and wonder, what's going to happen to us tomorrow? We, we don't have any money in the checkbook. We don't have any money to pay the bills. Listen, you go to Jesus, and he said, I'll not suffer the righteous to be begging bread. Now, maybe something meager, like a Bible school student with his wife and his little daughter going out to fly a kite with nothing but a can of sardines and a few crackers. But it was sufficient. That little girl's 50 years old today. She's doing quite well. Thankfully, thank God for it. The encounters of the Christian life are many and varied. These here, these four, are just the start of the venture of faith. But the sequence is important because it was the way the Lord wanted it to be. Your life 
being scared that you're going to perish in maybe Borneo somewhere. Demons around the world, drug dealers and all of the things that we're encountering, it's now manifesting itself in this country, which for so long, oh, we don't have any demons here. Listen, there are demons from the sidewalk to the top floor of executive buildings on Wall Street. There's demons in hospitals. There's demons in religious houses. There's demons in places that we can't even talk about tonight because we don't have the time. But there are demons. But do we have to go looking for them? There's plenty of them out there. Just walk close to Jesus Christ and let him handle the protection detail. Amen. Secondly, if we have this understanding, we can be calm and strong and confident in our Savior, the Lord Jesus, but we must stay close to the Lord Jesus. Amen? Man, I, I don't want to walk too far away from the Lord. I, I just don't want to. Now, there's too many enemies out there. There's too many snares of the wicked one. I want to stay close to the one who can handle it all. And he's at a whisper of prayer from me. Lord Jesus, you are not only my Savior, but you are Master of everything. What fear is chaining you tonight? Has some fetters on you? Is there something that you can identify, or is it something that only comes and goes once in a while? Just walk close to the Lord Jesus. He'll, he'll break the fetters. He'll break the chains. He'll give you victory. Because he is the conquering conqueror. Now, I was going to attempt to sing this tonight, but I'm going to read it to you. So, Laura, you don't have to be fearful. <laughs> we didn't practice. I was just going to bust it on her. But anyway, listen to this. I met the master. Now I belong to him. Like a babe, when it cries for its mother. Like a child, I was helpless alone. Then I met the master. Now I am one of his own. For all things changed. When he found me, a new day broke through all around me, for I met the master. Now I belong to him. Like a blind man who walks in the darkness, I had longed, I had searched for the light. Then I met the master. No, I no longer walk in the night. For all things were changed when he found me. A new day broke through all around me. For I met the master, and now I belong to him. Let's pray. Father, we love thee. Thank you that when you save us, you own us, and you are our master and the delight of our life. Lord, I pray that you would work in hearts and lives tonight to let your will be accomplished. Lord, there may be someone who does not yet belong to the Lord Jesus. Help them to come let you break the chains of fear of what it means to confess Christ as Savior. Help them, dear Lord, to come and meet someone who can share the blessed Lord Jesus Christ with them, leading them to a place of salvation and light.
for some of us who have been saved, Lord, it seems like we're just chained. We're, we're, we're hindered so much because of the fear of man, the fear of something else. And Lord, we have no reason to fear when we know the Master. You have every power, strength, and authority that you will exercise in your children's life. Lord, thank you for this hour. It's all for naught if we don't do something about our fear. Help us to put even the grain of mustard seed, a faith that is that small, the smallest of the herbs. Uh, Lord, help us to exercise that and cry out to the Creator God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the blessed Holy Spirit of God who is the Regenerator. Lord, help us in every way tonight, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.